All right, look with me in Romans 15, beginning in verse 1. Let's talk about building hope, building hope. Romans 15, verse 1. Paul says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak. Now, Pastor Nick shared with you the meaning of those words last week. Uh, those who are strong in their faith are those who uh, understand the freedom that we have in Christ. Those who are weak in their faith tend to be legalistic and religious. Those who are strong ought to be bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good. Look what Paul says, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance and encouragement taught in the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God who gives you endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 7. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore, I praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing praises to your name. Again, it says, rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples exalt him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. Look at Paul's prayer in verse 13, and we're done. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you might overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about building hope this morning. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to minister to us. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for your word. It is powerful. I pray that we'd encounter you through the ministry of the scriptures. If your heart agrees, would you say amen and amen. In 2007, we took our largest group ever on a harvest time missions trip. Over 150 people. We raised a half million dollars and we joined with two other churches to help rebuild a church in Chalmette, Louisiana, who had lost their building in Hurricane Katrina. While we were there, we ran a week-long children's crusade. We fed about seven or 800 people a night. We put on a play that had a salvation message. Joyce Myers sent us three uh, huge custom buses. One was a, a mobile medical clinic, one was a mobile dental clinic, and one was a mobile eye clinic. And so people who hadn't seen a doctor or a dentist or an op uh, optometrist in almost two years were able to get appointments. We were making eyeglasses for people right on the spot. But I'll never forget the ride from the airport to the building site. Although it had been almost two years since Katrina, New Orleans still looked like a war zone. On both sides of the highway, there was just devastation everywhere. There was still shrapnel in trees. The windows were blown out of strip malls and apartment buildings and motels. The roof of the New Orleans Superdome was still in tatters. When we got to Chalmette in St. Bernard's Parish, it was even worse. There were just cement pads where houses and businesses once stood. The only thing left of the church that we went to rebuild was the cement foundation and the steel ribs of the old building. I really wanted to weep because I couldn't believe that we were in the United States of America. Right next to the church site, a warehouse had survived the storm and the owner made the warehouse available to the church for its services. We sent down an advanced crew and they put in air conditioning in the building. Thank you, Jesus, because it was so beastly hot and humid and swarming with mosquitoes. But the leader of our missions trip had this vision to create a black box 
theater inside that warehouse. And we spent a good chunk of money on black theater curtains and rigging and stage lighting and hazers and seating. And I really wasn't in agreement with, with how much we spent to make that black box theater. But on the first night, I, I got it. When the people entered into that black box theater, they left the misery of their flood-ravaged existence for just a few minutes, and they entered into a totally different environment. The, the black box theater was cool. Uh, it was modern. It was clean. The climate was nice. There was no mosquitoes. It smelled new from, you know, the new curtains and the new chairs and, and all the new equipment. And I realized in that moment it was the most inspired idea ever. The, the black box theater transported everyone somewhere else. It was a magical vehicle of hope. I witnessed something similar in Nepal last summer. We traveled into the foothills of the Himalayas, into the villages. If I could sum up our experiences in the villages, it would be mud, sweat, and downpours. I I'm not sure I ever felt so gross in my entire life. There was no running water. There was no place to get clean. All we had was tubes of wet ones, and we went through all of them on the first day. But when we went into the village churches, it was like stepping into a totally different environment. The churches all have mats on the floor, and somehow, even though we were in the middle of a huge mud hole, those mats were completely clean. They had ceiling fans, the only fans that I saw anywhere in the villages. They had colorful banners. They had technology. It was calm inside the church. It was orderly inside the church. It was happy and advanced inside the church. I want you to think about that for a moment, and then I want to ask you to sign on to build something with us right here in Greenwich, right here in the suburbs of New York City, right here in Westchester and Fairfield counties. I want to ask you to sign on to build something with us that welcomes people into a completely different environment, that transports people someplace else. We're building a new building right now, but I'm not talking about the building. I want to tell you that the sanctuary is spectacular. We're going to take you back in in just a week or two, let you see the progress that we've made since Christmas time. I know you're going to love it. I want to tell you the light in the new sanctuary coming in through that skylight from up above, it's spectacular. But to be honest with you, this is Greenwich, and there are a lot of beautiful church buildings here. No, I, I want you to help us build something inside the new building. Something that transports people into a new environment. Not by the architecture, but by the spiritual realities inside that building. I, I want you to help us build a vehicle of hope. You know, that's what we're meant to be. We are meant to be an otherworldly environment that when people step into it, they realize that there's something better than the life that they know. We're meant to let people know that better is possible. Something better is possible on earth than mud, sweat, and tears. Something better is possible than the flood damage left behind in people's lives from the storms that they've been through. Peace is possible. Clean is possible. Order is possible. Joy is possible. There was a study in the country of Finland. Researchers took a mouse and they put it in a tank of water. And that little mouse tread water for about two minutes and then it sunk to the bottom. They rescued the mouse and the next day they put the same mouse back in the tank again and it tread water and just at the point that it was going to give up, they put a wooden plank into the tank and the mouse climbed up on the plank and was safe. The next day they put the same mouse back in the same tank and that mouse tread water for 12 hours because it was waiting for the plank to appear. You see, that is the power of hope. And we are meant to be an otherworldly atmosphere that gives people hope. 
And not just hope to keep on treading water, but hope for real change. Hope for the future. Hope for happiness. Hope for relationships. Hope for significance. Hope for success in every facet of the meaning of the word. Hope for life. Hope even in the face of death. That's what I want you to build with us. Oh, we need your help to finish the new building. But you know, I, I don't really believe that'll be a problem if we'll build hope here. So how do we do that? How do we build hope? Looking at Paul's words in Romans 15, I find a couple of steps. And I want to share them with you quickly this morning. A couple of steps for building hope. Step number one, get hope. Get hope. It's true in the Bible and it's true in life. We can only give away what we have. One day Peter and John went to the temple to pray. They passed a crippled beggar who asked them for money. They didn't have any money, so they couldn't give any money. You see, that's how we know that the first believers were Pentecostal. They had no money. No money. I didn't have any money to give. But that's okay because they were carrying something far more valuable than money. They said, we don't have any silver, we don't have any gold, but we do have something to give you. What they had was the fire of the Holy Spirit. What they had was the gift of faith. What they had was the mighty name of Jesus. And when they gave away what they had, the crippled man went away walking and leaping and praising God. You see, if we're going to build an environment of hope, we have to get hope first. And Paul tells us how in Romans 15. Hope comes from God. In verse 13, Paul says that God is the God of hope. I want to tell you, those are awesome words. Hope is the nature of God. Hope is the very character of God. Do you know that God is hopeful about you? He looks at you in hopeful love. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 says. When God looks at you, he sees hope for you beyond the messes of your past and the messes of your present. In Romans 8, Paul says that all of creation is subjected to frustration, but God is hopeful for its restoration. He is the God of hope. He himself is hopeful. What an amazing thought that is. David said, before I was even born, you thought innumerable precious thoughts about me. Hopeful thoughts. God is the source of hope. Anywhere in the world, hope is found that is only because of him. We are hopeful because he is love. We are hopeful because he is good. We are hopeful because he is merciful. He is a giver. He is wise. We are hopeful because he is faithful. We're hopeful because of who he is and because of what he has done. Paul says here that God has acted mercifully in history. God called a man named Abraham and he made promises to him. He said, Abraham, through your seed, it was the promise of a savior. It was the promise of a Messiah. Through your seed, all the nations of people will be blessed. God made promises to Isaac and Jacob. He made promises through Moses and Samuel and David and all the prophets. And then God fulfilled all of his promises by sending his only son, Jesus. Jesus served the Jewish people just as God had promised. Jesus suffered and died on a cross in our place and rose again on the third day just as God had promised. Do you realize that in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, Jesus fulfilled over 350 prophecies that were made about him hundreds of years before he came. Christianity is the only religion in the world that has the sign of fulfilled prophecy. No other religion can claim that. God left markers 
in history so that we would recognize his son and believe on him. And because of what Jesus did, there is hope for all people, both Jews and Gentiles. In Jesus, God's promises to save the Jewish people were fulfilled. And God's promises to include all the nations in the salvation of the Jews were fulfilled. Hope comes from God. He is hope. He is the hopeful God who gives us reason to hope. And he is the source of hope. Paul says here that God gives hope as a gift to us. He prays that God will give us the gift of hope and he reveals how God delivers it. He says here that God delivers it through the scriptures, through the Bible. Verse 4 says that from the scriptures we get endurance and encouragement. You know, everything that the heroes of faith went through is written down in the Bible for our example so that we can be reassured to hold on and trust God. From the scriptures, we learn that we have a great big God for whom absolutely nothing is impossible. From the scriptures, we learn that God cares and God can. From the scriptures, we learn that God is interested and involved, that God intervenes, God rescues and God restores, God guides and God provides, God protects and God preserves. From the scriptures, we learn that God answers prayer. When things seem utterly hopeless, yeah, that's okay, you can give them a praise. When things seem utterly hopeless, God gives breakthroughs. Against impossible odds, God helps us to win. In an instant, God turns the table so that those who oppose us are moved out of the way and we are moved up. From the scriptures, we learn that delays are not denials and detours are really just God's doorway to destiny. From the scriptures, we learn that what the enemy sent for our destruction, God has turned and used for our good and the salvation of many. From the scriptures, we get endurance and encouragement to hold on just a little bit longer. Weeping might endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I have been old, and I I have been young, and now I'm old, but I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. God delivers the gift of hope through the Bible. All the scriptures minister endurance and encouragement, but especially the promises that Jesus fulfilled. You see, Jesus fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies reassures us that God is a promise-keeping kind of a God. People change their minds. People break their promises all the time. But no matter how many promises God has made, all of them are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfilling the Old Testament scriptures reassures us that God is faithful. It reassures us that he is a wise and strategic long-term planner. I can trust him with the outcomes even when I don't understand the route that he has led me on. So we were at a conference in Atlanta this week getting our children and teen ministries ready for the move into the new building. It ended at 5 o'clock on Friday afternoon, and we had to get quickly to the airport through rush hour traffic. Now, I don't know if you have ever been to Atlanta, but they have mad traffic in Atlanta. And here's the thing. This is the way that I think. Anywhere, anytime I travel, I figure if you don't have the privilege of living in New York, at least the trade-off should be that you don't have to sit in mad traffic. Do you follow me? You see, to live somewhere other than New York and to have to sit in mad traffic is like a double insult to me. (laughs) Houston, really? I have to live in Houston and I have to sit in traffic? I have to live in Boston and I have to sit in traffic? No, 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 no. (laughs) To make matters worse, maybe you saw on the news that a couple of weeks ago there was a huge fire on a highway in Atlanta and it took out a bridge. It's a major artery and that is the highway that we needed to travel back to the airport. So Pastor Kimmy put on 
that GPS app called Waze to route us around the highway. That dumb app. It took us over hill and dale. It took us over all these residential streets. Have you ever been to Decatur, Georgia? They have, they have lovely homes. You're from Decatur? They have beautiful homes in Decatur. Gorgeous. Uh, 1930s bungalows, beautiful. I know because we drove on every residential street in Decatur, Georgia. I'm driving and I'm getting mad. Uh, uh, poor Kimmy. I'm like, there's no way this is taking us to the airport. There is no way. I knew, I just knew we were going to end up on a cul-de-sac. <laughs> but sure enough, we came out of side street and there was the airport dead ahead and there was no traffic. <laughs> you see, that's what we learn from Jesus fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies. God knows what he's doing. We can trust him with the outcome even when his ways don't make any sense to us. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. Jesus fulfilling the Old Testament scriptures reassures us that it is not in the nature of God to leave things unfinished. It's not in the nature of God to start something and not complete it. That's very good news because there's a very good promise in the New Testament. I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Not in the nature of God to leave broken things broken. It's not in the nature of God to leave things wrong without setting them right again. You see, can you feel the hope rising a little bit? Can you feel it? Can, you, that was just five minutes. That was just five minutes of scripture. And you can feel the hope. Imagine, imagine what would happen if we, we filled ourselves up with the scriptures a little bit, every, even just five minutes worth. Uh, imagine how much more hope we would get. Imagine how much more hope we would have to give away. Building hope. A couple of steps from Romans 15. Number one, get hope. Number two, get a voice. So we spent three days at this children and teens ministry conference in an arena that holds 13,000 people. And it was full. And the music was head rattling, ear-splitting, obnoxiously loud. I am officially getting old. Too old for this shirt, someone told me this morning. <laughs> the band was playing songs that nobody knew. They were playing them in keys that nobody could sing in with melodies that nobody could follow. They were having a good time, but all 13,000 of us were just basically standing there, you know, clapping along. But then all of a sudden, the worship leader broke into the chorus of the old hymn, I Surrender All. And the crowd came to life. All 13,000 people started singing at once. And guess what? we easily drowned out that head-rattling, ear-splitting, obnoxiously loud sound system. All it took was for everyone to lift their voice together. You know, more than any other time in human history, this world is an obnoxiously loud place. From entertainment to news media to social media to social movements, everyone is making a lot of noise. How on earth will the church ever be heard? How will our good news possibly be heard? Well, Paul says here it's actually quite easy. He says, if we will only get in unity with one another, our voice will be heard. Look at verse 4 of Romans 15. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves 
as you follow Christ Jesus so that with one heart and voice you might glorify God. So how do we achieve this unity? Well, here's one thing that we need to see from Paul's whole lesson in Romans 14 and 15. One thing we need to understand is that unity does not mean uniformity. Unity doesn't mean that we all think the same and that we all do the same. Unity simply means that we refuse to allow our differences to divide us. That protecting our unity means more to us than having our own way. Unity means that the common bond that we share in Christ is more important to us than our personal preferences and positions. Unity comes from focusing on Jesus rather than frowning on one another. Paul says here, follow Jesus. What would happen if rather than tracking every move that each other makes on Facebook, we spent more time with our face in this book. <laughs> what would happen if rather than commenting and quarreling and quibbling, we, we spent some more time in Bible commentaries? What happened if we stopped Snapchatting and spend more time chatting with God? What if we focused on Jesus? What if we focused on what he's doing? What if we focused on what he's saying? What if we focused on what he's like. May God give you a spirit of unity as you follow Christ Jesus. Unity comes from following Jesus' example of self-denial and sacrifice. Paul says here in Romans 15, do what Jesus did. Don't just live to please yourself. Think about what would build your neighbor up. In spite of your differences, he says, receive one another just as Christ Jesus received you. Last week, Pastor Nick shared with us about a welcoming spirit. And that's what Paul means when he says here in Romans 15, accept, receive, welcome one another just as Jesus received you. How did he receive us? He received us in our many sins. He received us in our many blind spots. He received us in our ignorance and our stubbornness. He received us in our prejudices, in our provincialism. Do you ever think about that? Jesus came to our planet as a visitor and he treated us like his honored guest instead. That word receive, I have to tell you the truth, it inspires me. I want to do better than I have done. I want harvest time to do better. You know, when you entertain a guest in your home, even though you might have differences of opinion as a gracious host, you're careful not to embarrass your guest or offend your guest. As a gracious host, you treat your guest with honor and dignity and deference. If a friendship develops, there'll be plenty of time for dialogue, even vigorous debate later. But while you're my guest... I am not going to disgrace you. What, what if we started thinking and acting that way here at harvest time? Doesn't matter if we agree or disagree. You're my guest and I'm going to welcome you and honor you. To be perfectly honest with you, the Holy Spirit really convicted me while I was studying this passage of scripture. I, I, I want the Holy Spirit to help me do better. See, something happens when we focus on Jesus and when we follow his example, God responds by sending us the gift of unity by the Holy Spirit. Everyone look at me for just one second. I want to tell you that unity is not ultimately the result of our best efforts. Unity is the unique work of the Holy Spirit in the church of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit creates a supernatural bond among us that is unlike anything else on earth. And when new guests come into our house, when they come into this house, they feel that. That they come into an otherworldly environment, an otherworldly atmosphere of joy and love and peace. And when we're in that kind of unity, our voice is heard loud and clear in the world. 
Jesus prayed for us. He said, Father, I pray for all those who will come to believe in me through the gospel. I pray that they may be one. And then the world will know that you sent me and that you love them. You see, we become like those 13,000 voices in the arena singing, I surrender all in unison. It doesn't matter if we're black or white or Hispanic or Asian. It doesn't matter if we're male or female. I'm going to say it. It doesn't matter if we voted for Trump or Hillary or we didn't vote at all. It doesn't matter if we supported this or boycott that. From all different walks of life and experiences and opinions, the Holy Spirit makes us one beautiful voice in Christ. And over all the obnoxious din, the world can hear us. That's what I want us to build together here at Harvest Time. Building hope. A couple steps from Romans 15. Number one, get hope. Number two, Get a voice. And finally, number three, give hope. Give hope. Worship team, you can come help me finish. You see, once we get hope from the scriptures and we get a voice from the spirit who gives unity, then we are in position to give hope to others. In these verses, Paul rapid fires four Old Testament quotations. And each quotation is a rung of a ladder that leads others to hope. I want to share with you the four rungs, and then we're done. Four rungs that lead people to hope. Rung number one, sing the song of an overcomer. In Psalm 18, David praises God because God has helped him to overcome. From the age of 17 to 30, David ran for his life from King Saul. And finally, after a lot of terrible experiences, finally, God's promise came true. Now, if you know the life of David, you'll know that when he wrote this psalm, there were still a lot of battles yet ahead. But David believed that the God who kept his promise yesterday would be faithful today and would continue to be faithful tomorrow. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The Lord liveth and blessed be my rock. And let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will praise you among the nations, O Lord. Even though we surely have some battles yet ahead in life, there is an overcomer's song in our mouth. Because God, who has been faithful yesterday, will remain faithful today and he'll yet be faithful tomorrow. When we have hope and a voice, the world notices our overcomer's song. Rung number two, invite your guests to sing along with your song. The second quote is from Deuteronomy 32. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. See, on the, on the first rung, one of God's people is singing alone. But on the second rung, a guest comes and joins the song. These verses, they lay out the story of how Gentiles came to be included in the salvation that God promised to the Jews. It's a major theme in the book of Romans. It's the theme of Romans. But practically, these verses show us how we, as God's new covenant people, can help more and more people to be included. Rung number one, a believer sings a song of an overcomer. Rung number two, a guest comes along and joins the song. Rung number three, your guest sings on his own. The third quote is from Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. And sing praises, all you people. You see, first our guest, he comes and he listens to our song. And then he starts singing along. And then he begins to sing on his own. Over the years, I've had so much fun watching people take this journey, especially the men. You know, I see their faces when they come for the first time. And they're looking around like, what is going on here? Heaven only knows why they come back, but they do. I think a woman has something to do with it. 
You know, women are in cahoots with the Holy Spirit. And eventually, after a little while, I see them one day and I see their hand like this. You know, just like this. So just worship, just worship it right here. And I see them close their eyes just for a second, you know, just, just for a second. And I wait a little bit longer and then I see them like this, worshiping the Lord. And they begin to sing on their own. They've gone from listening to singing along to singing on their own. And then rung number four, Jesus fills our guests with hope as they put their trust fully in him. The last quote is from Isaiah 11, verse 10. The root of Jesse will spring up. That's Jesus, Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. The root of Jesse will spring up. He will arise to rule over nations. And look what it says. The Gentiles will hope in him. You see, that's how we build hope. We get hope from the scriptures and then we get a voice from the spirit who gives unity and we sing the song of an overcomer and our guests come and they sing along and then they sing on their own until they believe in Jesus and they are filled with hope and here's the last thing and we're done all of this it leads to a community that is perpetually overflowing with hope. The last verse is verse 13. Look at Paul's prayer. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, something happens when God's people begin getting hope from Scripture. When we get a voice from the Spirit who gives unity, when we begin giving hope out to others, the power of the Holy Spirit descends upon that place and it overflows with hope. It becomes a perpetual fountain of hope. It becomes a hope factory. It becomes a beacon of hope. And that is what I want us to build together here at Harvest Time. The new building is great. And we're excited about it. But I want to build something inside the new building. Will you sign on with us to build hope here? Would you stand on your feet this morning and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a good praise in this place?